started, apologize for a slight delay, uh, so this may be time to ease. Um, I want to welcome all of you here today um, for the kickoff of a, a series that, that we hope um, will lend itself to not only, um, you know, refreshing staff um, and, uh, and maybe uh, giving them some access to some resources and other um, insight and opinions uh, that will help us moving forward. But the main purpose is, um, and I, you know, you know me, I'm blunt, so you can get offended and unoffended in the same pants you got offended in. Um, but we're here uh, in, in large part um, because we have some policymakers that have decided they want to get in the weeds um, when it comes to land use and zoning. And whether that's good or bad, um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not here to judge. I'm just here to, to, uh, to put it bluntly. Whether that's good or bad, my opinion is that if you're, if you're going to get into the technical side of the weeds, you ought to at least have some information other than, other than the fact that your neighbor doesn't want uh, a development next to you. Um, and, and I know that was a, a hard lesson for me to learn in my 12 years on the city council. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to do the right thing with, when the room's empty. Uh, you put four or five screaming uh, members of the committee of the concerned, as Raymond would say, and it makes it a little bit harder. Um, but uh, this, this will at least be able to give us an opportunity to decide how to move forward. And we've never been in a, in a more important time in the history of our community to have this type of conversation. We, you know, you just look throughout history, we've had a big footprint. We've had really abilities to get it mostly right, half right, not right at all, and still move on down the road. Because the, the region has grown despite the mistakes of the various cities uh, in, in the region. We don't have that shot again. The footprint isn't getting any bigger. We have to deal with the developments that are in place as they are. And as a result of that, knowing that our population, and I believe it's very conservatively estimated to, to be charging towards that 100,000 population in Rogers in a very short period of time. We gotta figure out where we're going vertical. Uh, we gotta figure out you know, where amenities need to be. What does infrastructure look like moving forward? Is it, is it 16 foot wide travel lanes? Uh, it, it, is, it, is it neighborhoods that have, that have streets big enough to park a car on either side of the curb still running a, a, a fire truck down the middle with four feet clearance on either side? And what is the cost associated with that at the end of the day? And what's the life experience of that at the end of the day? When you live in a subdivision, in which I just moved out of six years ago, I didn't even really know my neighbors across the street because we were so separated that even if, even if you were out on your front porch, it didn't even seem, a, you, you'd have to scream to talk to them because of the distance between setbacks and street widths and sidewalks and, and whatnot. So we've got to figure out what does community look like? And I think community in successful places looks like all of us in this room living next door to each other. Despite what our socioeconomic background is or abilities are, despite what our ethnicity and race is, despite what our political views are, the way to make healthy, rounded communities is community. And community doesn't mean living next to and only associating with people that agree with you. And so I think that this series has been strategically put together in a way that will both give you the human side of what this subject brings, along with the technical side. And for us to be most informed, we need to know both. So I hope that uh, I hope the time is well spent. And uh, if, if, if for any reason throughout this series, those of you that will be attending all of them or some of them, um, and then virtually, for some of our members that couldn't be here today, we'll be viewing this later. Um, if at any point your, you know, your attention span wanes or the speaker isn't very good, 
It's not my fault. I didn't put it together. <laughs> I'm just here. I'm long way to wrap. So anyway, welcome, and I hope that we have a good program for you today. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Hey, thanks for everybody uh, for you, you coming out to this. Um, you know, when when I came here and, and started this job in community development, basically Mayor Hines gave me the same talk that he just gave you about what does community development mean. And, and he has been very steady with that message. He has never wavered one little bit in his belief, which I share, that building a neighborhood is, is not done by building a big wall and a gate around a bunch of $800,000 houses. Or, you know, a neighborhood in the corner of your town with paper thin walls on $120,000 houses. It's, it's about diversity in every sense of the word, economic diversity and openness and open spaces. Um, and, and so that's based on principles. I mean, there, there is a principle behind that thought of equality and dignity and that everybody deserves the benefits of living in this land and in this city, that nobody owns that. Um, and so when you talk about the little decisions that you have to make in life, they're a whole lot easier if they're guided by a sound principle. And if, if you look at the history of Euclidean zoning, which most of the country has been built on, the principles behind that are not good principles at all. Those, those zonings were designed specifically to prevent people from living next to each other. And so we've got to understand where we came from and understand why we want to get to someplace different if we're going to have the fortitude to make the right decisions about things like apartment buildings and what we're doing in our downtown area. Um, there are reasons why we have designed density into our comprehensive growth map. So that's, that's what's behind all this, is to explain the principles behind what we, <coughs> what we have in our development code so that the decision makers are better equipped to stand up and, and understand what, what right and wrong looks like within the context of the way that we've designed our growth. Or if we as a community don't want to do that, then we need to know that because everything that we are doing is based on a set of principles that I think are good sound principles. Um, we're kicking this art off, this, this off with a discussion of art and culture. Um, we've got a couple of exceptional speakers today. You might say, well, why are we talking about art and culture at the same time we're, time we're talking about zoning? Well, I, you know, we were actually talking about the difficulty of defining art and culture in a meeting I was in this morning. Um, when I was the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development at the Air Force Academy, we define culture as everything that happens between people. Culture is essentially communication and how we communicate in every sense of the word. The, the, the words we choose to use, the way we dress, the, the way we do things together in community. And art is a very abstract but often profound form of communication um, and contributes to culture. So what, how do we use culture to manage growth? Well, part of it is if we can place the right cultural elements and, and the fertile field for cultural growth in place, then that tends to bring people together. And if you haven't been to downtown Rogers in the last several weeks and, and have seen what's happening on our playground and at our stage in these first few attempts to develop an arts and culture program, it's bringing people together. Um, Lake Atlanta is bringing people together. That park used to be a, a monoculture, then it changed to a different monoculture, and now it's a community. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing. And so without further ado, let me introduce Claire Weiss. Um, Claire is a, a founding principal at W, is that how we're doing it? Claire and I, think, I don't know. I think Allison first. Let me introduce <laughs> Allison Esposito. <laughs> Allison is the director of CASH, and I'll, I'll read this a little bit. She works with uh, the local creative community and represents their interests both with the council, the Northwest Council, uh, and the world at large through the Creative Arkansas Community Hub and Exchange. So if you wondered what CASH stands for, it's an acronym, and that's it. Um, Allison is an arts administrator, lawyer, and former professional dancer with more than 10 years' experience in the philanthropic sector. And she approaches her role with the perspective that we need in Northwest Arkansas to be able to take this thing to the next level. Um, I've worked with Allison. How long have you been here? Two years. 
I've, I've worked with Allison most of that two years, um, and, and we have been incredibly, uh, we're very blessed and I'm incredibly impressed um, that somebody was able to convince her to come here. She sees the potential in this place um, and is just an incredibly talented and hardworking individual that's making significant changes in our community. Thank so, you, thank you. amongst all those different populations to start really creating a vibey scene at all levels that really looks and feels like Northwest Arkansas that isn't just about the art that we're bringing in from the outside. Um, so that's what we're here to do and um, in just two years we've, we've done a whole lot uh, despite the pandemic. Um, we've had 26 programs, we've, we've partnered a lot with Rogers, I'll talk more about that, but these are just some of the things that we're, we're really working with is our core beliefs. Importantly, we, we think that the democratization of arts and culture will help all of us, where artists feel empowered to make stuff, where all voices are represented, where businesses are thriving and in our downtowns that are creative, we're all going to feel that and that's going to be here. And it's going to be great for business, great for community, great for talent retention, all the things that we're all working on. Um, and also, importantly, we're, we're working a lot with all of our different philanthropic entities, not, not just the Walton Family Foundation, but actually 12 different philanthropies across the region aggregating them, trying to help um, you know, get folks on the same page and have a shared vision. Um, but really it's about self-sustainability. So how can we help folks with seed investments create um, an ecosystem that sustains itself to some extent long term? We're thinking about the whole thing, again, for profits, artists and creatives. Um, but we believe in artists and creatives first. They're the key to any really healthy arts ecosystem, whether they're working in a nonprofit, whether they're working in a for-profit, whether they're running a, you know, a business here on your main street, these are the folks that we need to help support. And so Cash is here to help them build business skills and create more artistic quality, honestly, with them. Um, so that they're, in, in all the different ways that they're working, they're succeeding. Um, and this is really across everything. I talk about this a lot, but it's like visual art, performing art, dance, music, all the things you usually think about, but also like tattoo artists and culinary artists and fashion artists. So we're really thinking about the broadest possible definition of creativity. We also think that creativity helps innovation in the business sector. And so we're really trying to help smash those two fields together here in Northwest Arkansas a little bit. Um, I'll just say one more thing, which is, before I go into some data about our current state, we have all of this stuff here, you guys. I, I will say we spent most of the pandemic, I have this really awesome team of 15 folks, and we spent a lot of the pandemic figuring out what we have. And so we have nearly a thousand folks that have said, I'm a professional artist or creative in some capacity. That is on par with markets that are far more mature than ours and have been doing this work for a heck of a lot longer. They are working in every single creative discipline. We have um, 118 active nonprofits, 250 in our records that exist. Only 25 of those have been funded. So just saying that in terms of opportunity, help activate and elevate and invest in stuff, it's all here. Um, and that that is a very low number for creative for-profit businesses. This is based on a survey that we did in March of this year and some early results that we got back. We know the value as of 2017, economically, for arts and culture in the region. We are doing this study again. Cash is leading a study for the region in partnership with the national entity to determine what the economic impact is right now in 2021 for arts and culture across the region. It's gonna be a weird study. It's been a weird year and a half for arts and culture, but I can tell you this, everywhere else in the country, there's been a great decline, right? In events, lots of arts and culture entities have closed down. In Northwest Arkansas, ours have remained fairly stable thanks in great part to the generosity of our philanthropic sector um, and to some of the great bones that were put in place. So we're doing well and we're poised for growth to match the population growth that we're all sort of scarily facing right now. Um, <coughs> this is a, just a, a, some stats on the US economic value of arts and culture. It's a huge sector. It's a huge sector that really contributes and brings people together. 
Um, I'm supposed to focus on public art a little bit today, but I'll just say in general, you know, we got it all here. You can see that 6% of our artists in the region are currently focused on public art. Um, and about 7% of our organizations, but we have a, a vast range of activity happening. Okay, so in my last few minutes, I'll talk about public art and why public art. Um, we've been working with the city of Rogers since I got here because John and the mayor both said, we want to step out ahead and do this work first. We want to think strategically about how the city is supporting arts and culture. Um, they brought in Anna Watson and Justin, um, both, and I think this wonderful team of folks has really been leading strategically to think about what are the right plays for the city to make, what are the right investments for the city to make that can complement organizations like CASH, other organizations that exist in Rogers to really make this place what it has become. I'll say in just the two years that I've been here, downtown feels totally different. The, the amount of public art, the message of the public art, the way the public space are feeling, I'm sure you can all say that, that that's changing. We're excited to help continue to work alongside other folks to push that forward. Um, public art, I think, is a key area where the city of Rogers is leading in. Why the heck do we care about public art? Um, we can track, I mean, putting a piece of art in a public space might seem like an immeasurable, like how, how is this actually contributing to our economic vitality? All over the country folks are tracking what this is doing for communities. I come from Chicago. Um, when, the, when the bean went up in Millennium Park, um, the, the data that, that they've been able to collect, I worked for the city for a long time there, around the, the change in value of the condos that were adjacent, the change in tourism coming to the center of the city at a moment where the center of the city wasn't really that kind of a spot, is bonkers over the last 10, 15 years. That kind of stuff is happening across the country. We can, in fact, start to track in Rogers and other places. What is the economic value of putting these pieces of art here, right? It's, it's, it's actually there. Um, attachment and cultural identity. We have a lot of folks that are coming into the region. Um, how do we make folks feel welcome? How do we make them stay? This has been a question that has been asked to me a great deal of time since I got here from, from all ends of, of, of the region. Um, I believe in artists and art, first of all, and the reason I do this work is because I feel like it's, it's all of our voices, right? It's a, it's a voice that brings us all together. If we all go see some music, you may have one political belief, you may have another, we're all talking about bringing folks together. You don't have to necessarily talk about it, you're all experiencing something that's culturally awesome, something that's culturally different, you go in that direction together. That's the same role that <clears throat> public art can play, and um, public art in city-run spaces has historically and is increasingly playing that role in helping to catalyze important conversations, help people feel represented, um, help us unpack complicated histories, all of those things that can give you lots of examples of this work happening around the country. At CASH, we're about to launch a regional public art shop, the whole region, which will have an accelerator program to help cities um, figure out how to do this better and, and more. Also help artists figure out this practice and organizations. So we're, we're just a couple of months from that going live. Artists as contributors, these, this is just about really creative um, workforce development, getting folks ready to do this stuff, and knowing that artists are, are community leaders and they can help through community engagement understand where the conversation is and reflect that conversation in a piece of art that then brings folks together. I'm trying to get this all, all in 15 minutes, but artists as civic leaders is a very important point to say to you guys. Worthy of investment, um, they, really, they really do play that role. Social cohesion, um, you know, in encouraging engagement. You guys have seen what's going on here downtown. Um, I think the piece that you have on the wall, I don't know who made that piece of art. Who made the piece that has the words on it? Robert, yeah, Robert Montgomery. Robert Thank Montgomery. You. I have heard so many times that that piece is, is really um, standing out as a piece in the region right now as to where we want to go, how we want to be approaching it diversity, inclusion, and the, the sense of welcoming for all. More of that means that you don't have to explain how you feel. We can just put those things in our public spaces, say that out loud, take down our statues in the middle of Bentonville Public Square, and hope that people feel differently about the crazy histories that we're all embracing right now. Um, and then public health. Um, public health is, is you know, obviously a huge, a huge issue right now. Um, we're talking about health and mental health and well-being, and mental health, physical health, public art along spaces, but we're also talking about the intersection of, with Rogers right now, the field of health and, and art within those fields. There's a whole bunch of work happening all over the globe about 
the value of art in helping folks to heal and helping bring people together through that process. Um, so that's just another another factor. Um, I'm going to say right now where we are is that Rogers has um, you know a wonderful public art council in place. They've been working really hard with Anna to stand up their first big public art RFP. I know that there's a lot more opportunity around how to think about our <coughs> city-owned public spaces and how we're investing in what we put there and what we're trying to say with those pieces and who's involved and engaged in making those decisions. We're working with WXY and the city to come up with a cultural plan. What the heck is a cultural plan? I hope we'll hear more about it. It's a strategy and vision for the city for what they're gonna do in the arts and culture space. A big piece of it will be about public realm. But these are just some opportunities um, of things we can think about. It's not just about public spaces you know, owned and managed by the city. It's also about engagement of our developers um, you know, working in our, in our private spaces and thinking about how art um, can help them monetize and increase the value of their spaces and how if we have a shared strategy towards where we all want to go and what this place looks and feels like as we're developing it in this way, um, we'll probably will land in a better spot. And so it's some, some real estate development engagement as well as a city plan to do this with the right community voices at the table. I know I just said a lot of stuff fast. I'm a super fast talker, I'm sorry. Um, what, I think I'm supposed to ask you for questions for five minutes, is that true or no? <coughs> Let's hold that for okay. the end. I will not ask you <coughs> questions. No questions. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Um, next up is Claire Weiss. Um, Claire is, as I was about to say, is, is one of the founding principals at WXY. WXY is the architect that we have hired under the Design Excellence Grant to redesign the alleyways between 1st and 2nd Street. And so that project... I just started the video instantly. We could watch it. We could watch it. So that, that project's been going on for a while. Um, and, and we're about to the point of actually having some, some design to look at and some farm proposals, but, but you know, it's, it's really turning that alleyway space between about five blocks of alleyway in downtown Rogers into a place where pedestrians can spend time that would include our public art and make it more, more inviting to activate the alleyway so that some of the restaurants and, and new restaurants would form along the alleyway and then face the alleyway that is a corridor that people can use. It's a pretty wicked hard problem because the alleyway is full of nasty stuff. And how can we deal with all the nasty trash and everything else? So it's been an interesting thing uh, to work through and we're excited about where, where that's headed. Um, that alleyway, by the way, connects to you know, the rail yard park and Frisco Park via Centennial Park, which we will have advertised on Sunday to put out to bid for construction. So the design of that is complete. And that's gonna start moving along very quickly now. Um, Claire is also, WXY is also in a contract through cash to write our arts and culture plan. And so this, this mirrors what was in Vision 100, which I was going to read to you today until I realized there's about seven pages on arts and culture in the Vision 100 document. Um, I did not write that. That was through the committee that was, that was chaired by Raymond Burns and his group with support from a number of people um, to get that put together. So at the mayor's request. So that was a, a community engagement um, process and we're taking that plan and expanding on it with the agriculture plan. Um, Claire is the founding principal of WXY, uh, which is globally recognized, and this is all true stuff, by the way, for its place-based approach to architecture, urban design, and planning, and has played a vital role in design thinking around resiliency. In 2019, Fast Company named WXY one of the world's most innovative architecture firms. Claire was awarded the Medal of Honor for the AIA of New York in 2018 and was honored with a Women in Architecture Award by Architectural Record in 2019. Um, she's got her team with her. They're all wicked smart. They bring a great perspective and they're just really good people to work with. You know, we just got off a, a, a fun ride with, with Carol Ross Barney and that group. We've got another fantastic uh, group of people helping us out here. So, uh, welcome, Claire. Thank you. And, um, Allison, I'm really glad I went after Allison because she really set out what WXY and if you guys all away were even doing in this room, which is really about helping 
you all have those discussions about sharing the city. You know, like I, I like using the word sharing a lot because, in a sense, sometimes people don't understand what the word public realm means. You know, that sounds like it's a fantasy castle game, that a video game that someone's come up with. But actually, the truth is that it could public space or public realm, i.e., our streets and our parks and our lakes and our air we breathe and all and and the art we might share and even the lobbies that people can go in are really a kind of reflection of all the things that we can do together that we can't do by ourselves. Which it sounds like a very simplistic definition, but I think it's really true. And so what I want to do is um, reinforce what the mayor said or what John said, which is it's not easy, but it's super important. And what you guys are doing here is important, but we do not, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or Chicago, or Boston, or have any easier time of it. These discussions about convenience versus actually public health, or spending the time to actually work with an artist to make something worthwhile versus asking them to do it in five minutes, is our, our discussions happening everywhere. So I wanted to, even, I hope it won't be too loud, play a one minute video that we collaborated with a grassroots group called Transportation Alternatives in New York City. So you can see that fight over like, well, whose street is it? How do we understand each other? Is just as true. Okay, let's see if I can make this actually work properly. Oh. You asked me to Okay, I just muted it. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's muted. It's still muted. Yes, sir. Because we really want to hear all those honking noises again. <laughs> I'm going to make you run this. disciplinary firm because like all of you it takes graphic designers and artists and planners and architects and property owners and everyone to actually work together to get an understanding and which is why I think that the issues about getting something built finally has a lot to do with how you start by planning and, and so even though uh, really most of the work we've all been to together, we use the word plan. Embedded in plan is in fact engage, design, and build. And equally, it's kind of cyclical because once you build something, you're able to plan something else because you learn something from what you built. And what I want to talk about is the kind of mobility side of things, the things like before you guys get to your housing topic and your land use, mm -hmm. I think there's some important principles out there. These are some diagrams that uh, we've been working on actually with Uber, who is also, as a company, very interested in making cities better places. And yet, you know, a lot of their mobility is related to cars. And so there's a concept of a 15-minute city. And the thing that I've learned over the last two years about the 15-minute city is that, one, that's the way most towns like Rogers actually used to be. Rogers is the original 15-minute city. So was where I grew up in Calgary, Alberta. That was the original 15-minute city. And a number of other places, as cities grew, they had many 15-minute cities. So if you talk to the 
the, the planner in Paris who originated this, that's really transforming it, they, what, they, what he wants you to know, you all to know, is that it's not about making Paris a 15 minute city. It's about having hundreds and hundreds of 15 minute cities available to Parisians. So I think that's a really kind of thing I wanted to get across. The other, uh, other trend, which as true in Europe as the United States, is that that uh, does apply to what people need in more rural and suburban locations, which is that sustainability is dependent on children, older people that can't drive, uh, people who may, in fact, have had an accident or injury, and, and people that are disabled in many ways being an equal part of communities. And that, therefore, is ultimately the most sustainable the attitude is to create your public space, your mobility for, in fact, everyone, because that's where economic success comes from, actually, is not wasting either space, which we see a huge amount of wasted space in suburbs, but also talent. So that there is a 15-minute city movement that is related to how to readapt, how to, you know, like we adapt buildings, how to adapt places. The other thing that's, I think, really important is uh, electricity, right, energy. And that, in a lot of ways, artists have been the vanguard of, you know, many of the original experimentations about off the grid, about different vehicles. Even, you know, Karen, our office focuses on skateboarding, but when you look at the, mo the way cities are used, who's using, really, cities, usually kind of, adaptive system. So when we look at the opportunities of cities, microgrids, shared energy forms, like all of those things are much easier when you get a group of people and agree that there is public space that can be used for things, including charging stations, which I hear you have a couple of, but also how mobility hubs can start, like the kinds <coughs> of places where you can change modes are really an emerging uh, interest. The other thing that you are already doing here, and in fact we were admiring some of your curves and your speed tables, is the transformation of streets, very importantly separating modes, into a different kind of view of streets themselves. Like we're in a transition period and um, a young planner from Oakland said this in the other day in a lecture which is, it's not about modality, it's about mobility. And I think that's also a really important thing to keep in mind, which is there is not one, there's no magical system. If everyone had an electric vehicle, life would be good. It's the opposite. It's actually about, again, figuring out what a shared, seamless kind of plethora of choices might be. Okay, I'm gonna go more quickly. So this relates to dining in the street. So. Um, put out a kind of more national manual called Turning the Tables, relating to how do you look at not only parklets, but even parking lots as important opportunities for restaurants who are suffering so badly to create new markets, but also for people to have a reason to get outside. We did the Renaissance Pavilion in Harlem, which was really great because three different architects, three different artists, worked with three different restaurateurs on one street. Uh, in downtown Brooklyn, we've done both long-range planning, but uh, at the same time, looking at this idea of smaller kiosks, food trucks, how things, how the kind of architecture and graphic identity can tell you how to transform kind of streets into kind of places where three things can happen. One, better treatment of water visual understanding of these modes. So like, okay, if you're a cyclist and you decide to ride in a bus lane, your choice, but at least you know where it, where it is. And at the same time, you know, until we go completely to electric vehicles, we have a huge across the board problem with particulates. And the more we can get natural system and green into cities in, again, this transition period, the better. So that's like these are kind of lessons learned and how we go look at larger city plans this is all of downtown Brooklyn to get different developers 
to actually want to help with a larger effort. And that's really been the theme of a lot of our work, and I'm going to give you a glimpse of Rogers, and is that there's a term public-private partnership, but it gets back to the other phrase I use, which is sharing the city. If you can have plans that mean things to people and that are truly innovative and creative, that are really the, the best thing, that are ambitious, then generally that attracts private owners and developers to be want it, to be part of an ambitious plan. I've seen through many of these plans when you are only swinging, you know, for first base, like when you're only going, okay, we can manage to do this. Let's just do the low-hanging fruit. One of my warnings is you actually, in the end, never make anyone happy. You tend, like if you're trying to make one or two people happy, Generally, no one ends up being happy five years from now. Like, they might be happy in the first year, but if you really want your children to be happy, if you really want the next generation to feel like they have something, <coughs> some platform, not just an answer you gave them, but a platform for new ideas, then the ambition that really mostly now situates in arts and culture programming, that arts and culture programming has to go beyond an installation, but change people's hearts and minds. And I think that's where the real opportunity is, which is to bring that all together. And so that's really, I think, why the efforts um, of our team, there's no final design now, but I did want to say that the ingredients of what I showed are very much in this plan. And, and starting with not only you know, the steering committee meetings, but uh, individual interviews that Karen and Abby have been doing with people, there's some real realizations that are coming up here. And, and it's allowed us to kind of categorize concerns and start working towards objectives and principles that ultimately start to relate to real things. Like, oh, safety might relate to actually an access plan. Or arts and culture might relate to involving youth directly in public art plans. So it's not just what you thought before, but how do you take things uh, to something specific to the place it's in? <clears throat> and then it gets to, again, not wasting space. And so the real <coughs> opportunity, and again, it's because there's a, a vision for, 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 I think, really how culture and public health work together. And ultimately, for me, waste has to do with waste, not want not, but it, and it has to do with not wasting space, but also not wasting an opportunity to provide a kind of almost lantern to the future, right? So where you have a laneways and all over the country filled with waste bins, you can start looking at local opportunities in programming to actually elevate it and to future in the future really create more businesses. I mean, New York City in particular now has a, a absolutely a business in micro hauling. So that there's there never used to be a business to pick up compost and waste from from but now all of these young entrepreneurs are getting into this business and doing really well. And finally, you know, and again up sharing the city. Maybe if we can get people to actually look at the advantages of organizing things, then they'll have more room to do a dining terrace, they'll have more room to participate in a festival. And, and then it gets into the technical. So resiliency is a big focus of our work and what we see in regions that have real watershed issues is that some of the old techniques aren't working and there's an, a, a uh, as others put it, it's important to address it not where the problem is at the worst, but where you have an opportunity to actually do something at the problem at the top of the watershed, or at, again, where at the river's source. Not always where things are just too hard to manage. And New York City found this out the hard way in that they were, you know, this is before Sandy, they thought that they <coughs> could fix everything by, um, in a way, not only ignoring it, but, but just focusing on the worst problems. Well, what happened is that by focusing on the worst problems, it meant that neighborhoods that were doing really well, once you have an extreme event, or once when things got worse, 
all of a sudden, everyone in the city had a problem that no one had budgeted for. So in a, a way, many people are now looking at, why don't we look at the problem in kind of at where we can do something about changing people's minds instead of waiting till we need the largest waste water treatment plant known to mankind. So anyway, so that's really the kind of topics and why all these technical studies <coughs> And why today, after mapping the existing conditions, I want to give a shout out to Rogers too, because the city commissioned, because of our study, a 3D scan of, of the laneways in this, which has really never been done in public space. People use this in private buildings. And what, it's gonna, what it acknowledges is that there won't be, you can actually um, work on public space in a detailed way in order to commission a piece of art and that the, you have this resource there instead of sending people out to survey it every time. So I think that, that I mean, again, gets to this larger idea of tactical to fix solutions, how cities are looking at both short term and long term. But if short and long term are part of a larger plan of principles, then the short term actually indicates to people what they might want longer term. And that is going to be it. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. So I was, um, I was thinking we could just sort of open up the q and A. I'll start off um, a little bit. And, and I wanted to, both of these women threw a lot of information out in a short period of time. And, and as I was listening to these presentations, I realized that there was, e even as we're digging into the detail at, at this level, there is so much to know about the topic of city planning and community development. Um, so for example, Claire was talking about the 15 minute city. Do, I assume that not everybody knows what a 15 minute city is. Um, one of the foundational principles of a 15 minute, ci minute city is that you can generally conduct your business in life within about a 15 minute walk of where you live. And so, not necessarily everything, but in an ideal situation, you'd be able to live, work, and play within 15 minutes of your house. Well, it, it just so happens that our conference of growth map with the neighborhood centers spread at major collectors and arterials are spaced about every half mile. Uh, that means that, that you're within about a quarter mile of a neighborhood center. Well, most people, you know, if you're out hiking, you're probably doing about three miles an hour. If you're out just walking, you're doing about four miles per hour. That's about a 15 minute walk. So we did that very intentionally based on this idea of a 15 minute city. If you are doing, if you're focusing your multifamily development at those nodes, at those neighborhood centers, then you end up with the density to support things like arts and culture. Um, you can have, you know, small restaurants with outdoor seating and things that are about 15 minutes from <coughs> where you live. And you can also support future transit. So this gets into this multimodal idea. If we are planning our city in such a way to encourage density at these 15 minute walk intervals, and then we are not allowing the density to occur, then you never have the density to support the arts and culture assets, and you never have the density to support future transit, and you're guaranteeing just a future filled with suburb where people must always drive, and, and it's gonna be, you know, 30 minutes of bumper to bumper traffic just to go get a gallon of milk. So there's a lot behind these, these ideas, right? Um, so I'll, I'll lead it off. Last night, um, we had, we had uh, dinner at Yeo's, and, <laughs> and it was really interesting. And Claire, you, you know, you've traveled all over the world and <clears throat> been to a lot of places and the rest of the team. Could you just kind of describe what, what that was like? I, and I, and I hate to put it in these coarse terms, but how, how does our Yeo's rate in the world of, of culinary experiences <laughs> <laughs> always, always on the spot. But what I'm, I'm still going to try and answer this as an architect that loves traveling. I would love to have Yeos, forget traveling, a block away from where I live, no matter where I lived. Mm -hmm. Not, not just because physically it's a cool warehouse. Not just because that was the best taco salsa store I've had, you know, since Mexico City. 
But because the the owner and chef, he's okay, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Him is an expert and wants to sh wanted to share with us exactly where he was. There was an openness and a dialogue. This is what not only like architects who love traveling for that reason, we are, all of us are sponges for knowledge. And when you can get in situations where you can sit on the street, when you can look at one table and there's a extended family, and another table it looks like two college professors who, who actually were invited to an artist show. Like, you see that kind of diversity, and we as a group feel welcome. I mean, I, you know, and I'm asked, uh, you know, any of the other demographics, why don't you add to this? I feel like that's the goal, right there. That's the goal. You mentioned that we sat on the street. Could you talk a little bit about how that played into the overall experience? Well, you know, one of the things that when people first started making plazas or sitting on streets, um, the first thing out of more traditional planners was, oh, no one's ever going to go there. Why would you go in the middle of the street? As soon as it happened, people started realizing that <clears throat> We were giving the best views in the view corridors, and we were to cars. Like, the best views of cities were cars. And so when you're sitting out on a parklet, and we were sitting in tables, which very comfortably, by the way, you actually get, you can see the park, you can see people biking, you can see more. And so outdoor dining is actually like um, a way of, touring something except you're eating and drinking instead of having to walk around parts. So it, it's, I think, a new perspective for people, and I love it. And I would just add, in terms of the work of why invest in developing creative talent, you know, Raphael is an amazing example of when through bread, the culinary is one of the fields where we're really doing this in the region of soup to nuts right now. You go to the Culinary Institute, you learn how to do the craft, you're provided with the right resources to see fund your business. It started as a food truck. Some philanthropic resources added to that, and then he's been able to build a pretty banging business for himself and a whole bunch of other creatives and folks that are sort of attached on at this moment, supporting him. And so I think it's, a, it's like one of my favorite success stories in the region, and something that we need to think about across all disciplines because he's helping our downtown, he's activating our streets, and he's bringing something truly authentic that represents his culture, but also. He's been here for 18 years, so it's very much oh, of and by Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. Hey, here's a softball. Is it worth the cost of giving up half a dozen parking places to create that <laughs> parklet? Well, that's you, Allison. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's vibrantly, it's vibrantly activated every single minute that it's open. Yeah. 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 So Claire, I, I have a question for you. So when you think about, let's, let's stay on the topic of, of geckos, right? And so I love the idea and the concept of growing downtown Rogers, bringing in more, um, more of the artistic approach, making it walkability, increasing our walkability, et cetera. But when you think about it from a policy point of view, um, some of us in here are on the city council, and we hear from our residents about the safety of taking away the parking spots to make this space. From an architectural point of view, what, what is your opinion or your perspective of how do we do this in a manner that is safe and our residents can over, they can get past the fact that they feel like they're sitting in the middle of the street or they're, they're you know, at any given moment, there's a swerve and you're, you're popped. Like, what's your point of view um, of how, how do we address that? How do we, how do we create the narrative or a point of view that is around safety? Well, I think this is where kind of the public government comes in, which is speed limits are a huge issue in cities, period. You know, at 25 miles an hour, people die. <laughs> At 10 miles an hour, they actually, they get injured, but you're going slow enough that you can recognize a, a dining spot from, a, you know, from a, something else. And, and so if one imagines the opportunities of a walkable, bikeable, but, or even drop offable, like as in drop off your family and go park your car somewhere, then you, everything has to slow down. Mm -hmm. And that slowing down, actually has to be part of what people are looking for 
And then, in addition to that, most cities start putting into some sort of rules about what, how planters are protective. And, mm-hmm. and that's, I think, also a design opportunity, mm-hmm. which is, you got some other goals too, which is, we do want more shade. Okay, we could actually come up with a standard for protection and shade at the same time for those in-street parking spaces. We could also start prioritizing some streets as slow or shared streets so cars who want to go faster get to know that and they and their patterns change. I mean, in general, visual design solutions being clear to people, like of all languages, people tend to ignore signs, but if, the, if something is like a speed bump and it's bumpy and there's other signs for things and the, the lighting tells you to slow down or there's even some blinking lights, I mean, I think one thing that's been really successful, uh, you know, it's not in non-American cities generally, is when you're getting into a slow zone, they have these little LED lights that actually go on. So even very late at night, it tells people, oh, I'm entering a zone that I'm not supposed to just go through. You know, again, there's always people that are going to break rules and then figuring out how it's, you know, has, if it becomes inconvenient to drive fast through something, that might be a way to do it. But again, dialogue, I would say dialogue, but, but being willing to stand up for the rights of people to walk maybe mm-hmm. is also part of it. And, and one thing that we've done is in to this is the, the design of the street creates the speed limit. You know, even if you don't post a speed, um, people are going to drive a certain speed on most roads, uh, or, or people are going to speed if you post a speed limit that's unreasonably slow, based on the design of the road. And so, as another controversial thing that we hear a lot about is street heights and reducing lane widths, and how wide does a lane need yep. to be? Um, our, our standard for all local streets in the city of Rogers is 10 feet, and it has been for years and years. We build 10-foot wide lanes all the time, and we have started converting some of the downtown streets to 10-foot wide lanes. We have lanes that are less than about 9.5 feet on 71B running through Rogers that people don't realize that's less than a 10-foot lane. That slows people down. Putting trees on lanes slows mm-hmm. people down. Um, we don't like a lot of jinx and things like that. The speed table that we installed at First and Walnut takes the roadway to the pedestrian height. So we're raising cars up to the sidewalk level. That, that tells people that now I'm in the pedestrian area. You know, I've, I've entered a pedestrian realm and I'm no longer on just a flat street that's designed for speed. So, and then the design of the parklet is important also. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think the design of the parklet and it, in a way, making it easier to make safer parklets for restaurateurs, but yet give them the creative flexibility, is something that programs and stuff are really good at. We, we really suffered in New York from, like, it was the Wild West, basically. Mm-hmm. People did whatever, and a lot of those structures failed, <clears throat> fell down in the middle of the streets, and only really after did um, kind of some of the standards start coming in. And, you know... 2020, I think, was just shocking to everyone on what was needed to get anything done. I think now looking at it, um, New York City is making outdoor dining permanent, and therefore with that is trying to also make a kind of one-stop permit for it and a kind of checklist so that restaurateurs don't have to, like, sweat every rule. they like, if I did this, okay, and if I did this, and then the fun part I get to do. You know mm-hmm. what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> I, so I'm studying landscape architecture right now. So I love this whole talk um, because I think about arts and culture all the time and how it relates to you know this city. And I was wondering if you had any specific thoughts about um, sort of like I guess the beautification of infrastructure that people typically see as like ugly or unsightly, um, like, for example, like, something I've been working on in, like, the studio has been, like, whenever people think of, like, solar panels or renewable energy, they can sometimes think about it as taking up too much space or just being 
kind of boring, but you know, there's people all over the world and entire organizations dedicated to, you know, thinking about how you could make like sculptures and like public spaces where where that's like a key component. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any experience with stuff like that or just any thoughts about about some that sort of area of, of beautification. You know, start? Well I'm gonna answer it one way and kick it to Allison, which is I think artists, like if you think about lofts, right? Like the one I'm staying in and here behind Onyx, but also New York City and other, people thought that was very ugly space. So who was it that actually transformed lofts and made people think about older buildings and saving them differently? It was primarily artists. And I feel like, um, uh, solar hot water and all of these, you know, wind turbines and other things, you know, it's usually the creatives and artists that are in the forefront of trying to change people's minds by again, kind of, kind of doing something really interesting that captivates people. And so I think there's a lot of lessons in that. And for the alleyways, you know, the transformers and the electric there, by most people could say that's really ugly, but if you talk to people who've been in Rogers a long time, they're like, I really think that's interesting. And so getting to, it's artists that tell you why it's interesting and alert people. So I think that there's a real opportunity, both in landscape and architecture, to actually collaborate more with doing projects that kind of ask those questions more openly. Why is the solar panel interesting? What is that transformer doing up there? That kind of, um, I hate the, the word didactic, but it kind of works. Like, how do you make people look up and, or look down and kind of know where they are? I think that's where art always comes into it for me. I mean, I love your answer. I don't have too much to add, except that I think a lot of this is, is starting to happen and, and will continue to happen in the region, and we're looking at it with an eye towards sustainability and renewable resources and not just knocking down things because they maybe are not the shiniest thing and and that there's some real value in having raw and interesting warehouse spaces that are an open and blank canvas for artists of all kinds to 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 play with right now um, our organization has just taken on the operation of five of the most Frankenstein crazy buildings in Bentonville (laughs) that are actually going to be knocked down in five years unless we prove that they're so valuable that we shouldn't um, because there's an incredible need for artist space in the region. We have a ton of folks working. We don't have a ton of space for them to to make. Again, one of our biggest needs, make stuff here locally. Let's let's actually stop importing. And so we're going to you know, get artists in there subsidized to make. They're already in there. We threw an event in May where we opened up the space to the public. Thousands of people showed up. And, and each, part, each person has a different room. And every room feels totally different in this giant warehouse. And, and it's one of those experiences where folks are like, I can't believe this exists in Bentonville where everything else feels really, um, you know, like sort of gorgeous and clean and crisp at this moment. And they, they felt very comfortable in that space as from an audience perspective is the feedback that we got. So I think there's a huge need for more of it. Um, give us your warehouses is what I would say in general. <laughs> Tagline. One thing that the mayor mentioned is that, that we're in a, maybe the most critical point in our history. And, and I, I agree with that. I think we're at an inflection point where we're growing from a large town to a small city. And with that comes a lot of challenges and problems and opportunities. Um, we love asking outsiders around here what they think of Northwest Arkansas. I don't know, it's something I grew up with. Every, you know, people just do that here. What do y'all think of Northwest Arkansas? How would you describe sure, Northwest Arkansas outside, if you too. go to Boston yeah. or Chicago or someplace? And, and do you see that we are at a critical point, or is that just our own myopic kind of thinking? Uh, would you like to go first, or me on this one? Oh, I'm going to make you go first, <laughs> <Okay>. totally. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I do still feel like an outsider, even two years in, um, and working really closely with community and really deeply in, in every community in the region. Um, I mean, I, I moved here for a reason. I moved here because my interview process was actually the community interviewing me. So I was interviewed by 40 community members in Northwest Arkansas from various vantage points, and I kind of fell in love with them, if I'm honest. And so I think this is a place that is unique in its people and in the way that people actually are sort of 
you know, either opposing or welcoming this change, but jumping in to figure it out, right? Um, And so I I think we're absolutely at an inflection point. I feel like some of the change that's happening um, that I'm excited about is that I felt like when I moved here, most of the change felt like it was pretty top down, if I'm honest, or had been pretty top down. And it feels like because of the social justice movement that we're in nationally, because of the pandemic, um, sort of leveling the playing field, and because of our need to get this stuff done right and quickly, communities are being engaged differently. The change is feeling a little bit more like everyone is a part of it or wanting to play a role and having a voice in that. And I also am feeling um, the differentiation from city to city, right? Like I think each city, mm-hmm. there's this, I, I'm one of very few organizations working at a regional level And yet I'm really excited about helping each city, partnering with each city to figure out what it's uniquely bringing to the table. I think about it as an MSA. I think about the whole thing. I think about the whole thing as a city of different neighborhoods, um, each of which has a really different thing going on. And if we can just lean into that and pull together the folks that are there, we have all the things we need in the MSA already to start doing what we need to do. So uh, yes, the change is fast. And I think everyone's hopping on board in a different way, starting to. Um, I'm going to finish up, but I'm going to pass either Abby or Kara, who's who had never been here before, oh, okay. because I think it would be a benefit to hear, because this is my second trip, so I get to reflect on that, but either one of you guys, this is like a first time, and yet you've been talking to people for a year. <laughs> Any thoughts? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like we've been gifted with this opportunity to come to Rogers and it's, it's, it's incredible. Of course, we would have liked to make it out here a long time ago at the very beginning of the process because there's really something to be said about physically being in a space and feeling it and being able to embody some of the things that we're hearing from people. Um, uh, you know, as Claire mentioned, we've been talking to people for almost a year doing interviews with local business owners, um, arts organization representatives, um, but to actually, you know, at least for the alleyway part of, part of our project, to actually be able to walk the alleyways and understand, um, understand on a new level how restaurants are actually using that space. Imagine how that space can really be transformed. And to see that it actually, it's, it's at a point where it's, oh, it's, it's getting to the point where it can be habitable. There's like it's not it's not that far away before we can get to the get to the point where it can really be activated where it can feel comfortable. Um, uh, Abby, what whether? Well, I was just to, I mean I, I agree with everything Kara has said and certainly kind of like the engagement we've done virtually it's it's so rich to be here and kind of like match that. But I feel like we already were getting to know Rogers really well through the people we were. Um, talking to and there's a lot that just kind of we, we you know we could in some ways we really got to know the city through those stories but I wanted to share one anecdote because I think we originally asked John kind of is this perception that we have that Rogers is at a critical inflection point is that true to kind of like an outsider so I just wanted to share an anecdote that another part a really key part of our planning work at WXY totally separate from this is we do a lot of school planning and just to share that recently some of our analysts did this like nationwide sweep analysis of like where where are critical growth centers for school age children. And funny enough, like we had some some of these analysts coming, hey by the way, Rogers, Arkansas popped up on this analysis we did of the nation. This is really <laughs> interesting. Um, so just to say that even when you're looking at this like really macro view of where are where are regions that are really growing, where are regions that are seeing also a lot of rapid demographic change, diversity um, change. Um, that even on a nationwide scale, Northwest Arkansas still like, <coughs> pops up on the radar. So even if we had not been doing this work, we still would have kind of like zoom, you know, honed in on like what's what's happening in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to show that. Absolutely, and it's interesting to see to to actually be here and understand on the ground what diversity does look like in Northwest Arkansas, and what it you know we we throw around the words inclusion and welcoming a lot, especially when we talk about public safety in the alleyways. Um, and, you know, we're still coming from a very, like, East Coast sense of what inclusion means, what you do to make, uh, make a downtown feel inclusive, make a downtown feel welcoming. But to be here and really understand the kind of hospitality that's already built into the culture here and how mm-hmm. that, you know, that there's, there's something to be said about giving a space 
to that culture that already exists, that culture of, you know, I, on, I ended up not having to get an Uber to my Airbnb because the woman sitting next to me on the plane had her son drop me off and then came inside the Airbnb and it to make sure that it was suitable. Otherwise, she would have, she would have kidnapped me and had me live in her house. Um, <laughs> But you know that that's something that you get if you're if you're in those spaces. If you're sitting next to someone, like literally rubbing shoulders on an airplane, you get to experience that culture. How do you how do we create spaces in the alleyway that really elevate that culture, elevate that sense of this is a community we help each other and we bring new people in? Um, you know, I think that's what's been really important about us coming here and being able to look around and see. Um, you know, how, how the city is not just changing demographically when we look at the census data and how, you know, the census data has changed over the last 10 to 20 years in terms of, you know, the expansion of the Latinx community, um, the Marshallese community, and um, the, uh, the change in age, um, you know, how many young people there are here, but also how those, how those communities are converging um, downtown and what work there is still left to do to make sure that there are even more opportunities for diverse communities to converge downtown. Um. And I, I would just add one thing, which is I've been doing, you know, change management work mm -hmm. for cities and in places for a while where, you know, you're, you're looking at systems, large scale systems, and you're trying to fix them. And my goodness, that's a giant pain in the butt, right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I just came from Boston where these systems have been in place for hundreds of years, right? <sighs> So I would say what I find is really interesting here is that there are some systems in place, but a lot of this stuff, we're actually in the moment of developing whole cloth from scratch. And so, yeah, we're going to mess some of it up, but it does feel exciting to be at the table of a place that's considering these things for the first time in some regard, right? We don't have to fix what we've done wrong. We can just learn from everybody else's mistakes and start to do Hopefully some stuff start differently out on the right now. Foot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that... So how many years ago was it that I came to visit I think three three yes so uh, yes. in three years I now see that some of the same places that are completely different and the new things that are here the new renovated warehouse the the park even in all of the the, the paved uh, I call it mountain bike track mm -hmm. whatever yeah, yeah. and and the, and the bikeway none of it which were here have created a kind of tipping point. So the, for me, it's like, wow, that's so few, that huge things relative to a relatively um, small city, but those things alone have actually created way more than I would have expected they would. Like, there's, there is something happening here, and I would hope that more things, like, that it's like, that rolling stone is going to keep rolling because there's momentum. It's a, you know, like that uh, Malcolm Gladwell tipping point thing. It really yeah. does. I feel it. And that's really from like just dropping in now after a pretty intense three years, including 2020. But it does feel like that tipping point is way more interesting than I thought it was going to be. It's terrifying. Any, any other questions? We're about out of, yes. So, um, this that conversation about diversity and inclusion and also just being a hot spot. I feel like in the planning office, we get a lot of calls from people who are like, oh, I'm from out of town, and I really think Rogers is an interesting place to build, but we also get a call that's like, I'm from Rogers, I want to invest here. But maybe, especially even in our downtown areas, the kind of like glazing or the kind of like dressing up and pedestrian friendly things that we want people to do feel like a high entry point mm -hmm. for some people is not, it doesn't feel affordable or attainable. Mm -hmm. So you don't want outside people coming in and being able to do these things where you mm -hmm. squelch the talent that's already here. That's a here. really so, interesting question. So mm -hmm. what do you recommend, what kind of things as the city do we need to be aware of or maybe we need to be a little bit more flexible to make it so that people who are from here can build? Mm -hmm. Would you guys like to go first? Gentrification. I think, and I think Allison, you have some. Yeah, you definitely I mean, have some. We're really hyper local, so we, we call ourselves an exchange because we are. We do believe that there are things that are not here, and humans that are not here, and artists that are not here, and we we want to build a, a melting pot where all of this is existing. But but we are hyper local focused at this moment. 
And so I would just say um, incentivizing and subsidizing in different ways um, for populations that need those incentives and those subsidies to be able to focus on their art making, to get their business off the ground, is what is what we're focused on. And we live in a marketplace where we're very blessed with the resources to be able to do that. And so first it's figuring out who are the folks and who are the populations that um, that need it in order to receive equitable resourcing um, a bit more right now. And we're really focused on filling in those gaps, I would say. And I think all of it is about programming, right? So. I didn't intend, when we started this off, we were very much like a backstage kind of organization, here to help everybody else do all the stuff. And we've stepped in ourselves to a more sort of programming and creating public art and events space, in great part because there's a hunger to connect the public spaces, the stages that we're building across the region, the venues, the organizations that have this, the spots that folks want to visit with the diverse talent that is here. And there hasn't been that connectivity or that knowledge. And so we're sort of stepping in the middle to say, um, let's make sure that we're doing something for every single audience. So, for example, in Springdale um, right now, every Thursday night, we're doing music. And we have a layered bill, and we're curating curators. And we're, and we're ensuring that every week it's a totally different kind of music, demographic of curatorial human in charge. We're resourcing them to be able to bring in different groups and bands from their community, about their community, in a <coughs> sort of way. We're doing this over 24 weeks. And what's happened so far is that the folks that are showing up in downtown Springdale um, are actually really consistent and sticking it through, but, but additional folks are coming in every week because their favorite band is on stage, their family member's on stage, their person is on stage. So we're doing a lot of it programmatically, if that makes sense, while also providing incentives and resources, honestly, where there haven't been um, resources provided. Does that make sense? How about this, I this idea of a high bar of design and requirements that, that eliminates some some developers and, and we're going to get in this is a critical I, issue yeah i want to talk water. directly yeah, to that so i think it's back to this pr first principles stuff which is a lot of developers let's say whether it's a local or they they want to develop under rules everything's already known it's really risks that are the issue if you can be very clear about the quality and the, the pricing on that quality and the availability and the opportunities for subsidy of repairing a cornice or putting a great window in that you have those available, then people's excuse to do things badly, it, that excuse isn't there. Now, if you put it out there and just say, we demand you, you know, ch tell us how you'd want to do it, mm -hmm. and this is, again, uh, then you're going to just end up having a lot of tension around thing, projects not meeting shared goals. So I, so I do think the issue of being really clear about shared goals and, and being clear about the resources available for local, local to get to those shared goals, that really, I think, m will make a huge difference. And could, do you think? Well, and I'll just say that that is a huge gap right now in general, whether it's philanthropic or governmental, I think it is hard to find information to be like, I want to do a thing outside. I want to get a business license. I want to apply for a grant. There hasn't been a ton of transparency across the board. No, this, no, this has no been a huge here. Well, at least it's our codes are published, great. unlike Midville. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. You guys are doing great compared to everybody else. But, but in but general, I think there there's always a, there is a preconception that that disadvantaged communities um, kind of like they that they want they somehow want less or they'll produce this is yeah. completely untrue yeah. that in fact the there's a real that most people want great projects mm -hmm. beautiful buildings and beautiful streets mm -hmm. the issue is there are many uh, kind of people who really have not been given access mm -hmm. to either how do you get that done? Or this is how you get this kind of a loan in this phase is to do it. And so it's really about making the route to excellence available mm -hmm. on a local level, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, last year when the Arkansas legislature prohibited cities from imposing design standards on single family housing, they, that was kind of shrouded in this, this idea of equity. But the solution to affordable housing is not to make cheaper and cheaper houses, yeah. mm -hmm. is to make houses more smartly. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, nobody wants to live in a piece of crap house. Mm-hmm. It's, but but how can we how can we change our development code to encourage missing middle missing middle housing, um, mixed income housing, you know, more diverse housing uh, products? So, um, yeah, really good question. Thank you. Um, all right, that's all we got. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll be lingering around it. Did you have anything else? Yeah, we're good. Thank you, everybody.